Hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from Ghostly Tales for Ghastly Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called... Tag. Terry Blotch was a spotty child. At the age of nine, he had a face like a piece of nutty chocolate, all lumps and bumps and bits of dirty sticking plaster. His parents had tried everything from steam baths to cheese graters, but nothing could quell the mass of heaving eruptions all over his face. Now, before we go any further, I don't want you to start feeling sorry for Terry. I know it must have been awful to look the way he did, but he did bring it all on himself. Six months earlier, he had looked just like every other child of his age, snotty, dirty, scabby, muddy, and dragged backwards through a hedgy. But, and this is a big but, there was not a single spot to be seen anywhere. It all started on the morning of Jonathan Moore's birthday. Jonathan was one of Terry's friends, and for a birthday present, he'd been given the hugest marble in the world by his Scottish grandmother. It had been delivered the night before by an exhausted postman who had rolled it 500 miles from Glasgow. You can imagine the scene when Jonathan rolled his marble into the school playground. If he had been pushing a giant Malteser, he couldn't have had more attention. The children swarmed over it like wasps, and Jonathan was the hero of the day. To everyone but Terry. Have you ever been jealous? Have you ever had that little green worm crawl into your ear and whisper, Why is he getting all the attention? You're just as nice as him. In fact, you're nicer. Natalie's only looking at him like that because he's got a big marble. It's you she really likes. Go on, get in there. Make everyone notice you for a change. You deserve it. He doesn't. Terry heard that persuasive little voice on the morning Jonathan brought his marble into school. It made him so jealous that all he wanted to do was to hurt his friend, and the only way he could think of doing that was by stealing something from Jonathan that Jonathan really liked. While all the other children were preoccupied in the playground, Terry slipped back into the classroom shutting the door behind him so that Mr Sissons, their teacher, wouldn't see what he was doing, Terry crept over to Jonathan's desk and opened it. Inside, there was a ruler, several rubbers, four broken pencils and a ring with a skull on it. Terry's hand darted out like the tongue of a chameleon, and before you could shout, THIEF! The ring was snuggling amidst the sticky sweet wrappers in Terry's trouser pocket. Now, as any thief will tell you, the first time that you steal is always the worst. After that, it becomes progressively easier. You stop worrying about being caught, and you become more daring with each theft. But each theft feeds your greed, so that six months later, Terry was no longer content to snatch rings with skulls on them. Each time, he wanted something bigger and better than the time before. In his room at home, he was amassing quite a treasure trove. Jewellery, bags of sweets, comics, radios. He even had a pet dog for a while. But when the dog started peeing on his bedspread, he decided to return it pronto to its owner. One day, while the other children were at break and Terry was in his customary hidey hole in the locker room, his shifty eyes fell upon a gym bag. He noticed it because he had never seen it before. It was hanging all by itself from a peg high up on the wall. He could not resist taking a look inside it, just in case there was anything worth nicking. The first thing he saw on the bag was a large name tag. A. Phantom, it announced in bold letters. Terry had never heard of a boy called Phantom, but it hardly mattered because inside the bag was a brand new football kit. Just what Terry had always wanted. There was only one problem. 
The shorts, the shirt, the socks, even the football boots, all had one of these name tags sewn into them. Terry made a snap decision. He wouldn't worry about it. Then he sauntered out of the locker room with the bag slung cockily over his shoulder, as if the football kit had been his all along. If he'd bothered to look back at the peg upon which the gym bag had been hanging, he would have seen it disappear in a puff of purple smoke, leaving in its place a thin trickle of green slime, which slid down the wall and stripped the paint off a school bench. Terry's new football kit was much admired by all of his school friends. In fact, I dare say, that little green worm of envy crept into a few of their ears when they first saw it. Terry wore it most of the time, and as A. Phantom never challenged Terry to return his kit, Terry thought that he had got away with the perfect crime. What Terry didn't know was that he would never be challenged by A. Phantom because A. Phantom did not exist. A. Phantom was a ghost, an exceedingly law-abiding ghost who travelled through time and space in a never-ending quest to bring thieving children to justice. It was about this time that Terry started to notice little red marks appearing on his legs, on his waist and on the back of his neck. He'd been aware that the name tags in his new football kit rubbed him slightly whenever he wore it, but this was to be expected. He had never come across a name tag that didn't itch. That was partly why mothers sewed them into clothes, he thought, to ensure that their children's knickers were all lumpy and bumpy. But the red marks would not go away. In fact, they got worse. He started to scratch them in the middle of the night, which was quite the worst thing he could do. They got angrier and angrier until one morning he woke up to find himself covered in tiny purple lumps. The doctor took one look at them and declared, No chocolate, no sugar, no sweets of any description, sticky buns are out, and Coca-Cola is a definite no-no. I want to see you eating greens, lots of them, plenty of fresh fruit, brown bread, and a large spoonful of vinegar before every meal. Terry's face turned a nasty shade of green. But doctor, said Terry's mother, what's the matter with him? Well, I haven't got a clue, replied the doctor, but that's what I eat every day and it's never done me any harm. Next! That night in the bar, Terry's mother let out a little scream as she turned Terry round to scrub his back. The purple lumps had spread. Oh, they're all over your back, she yelped. Oh dear, Terry, you haven't been playing with any chickens behind my back, have you? What? said Terry, who didn't know what his mother was talking about. I think it may be chicken pox. It's not chicken pox, Mum. The doctor would have said so. Well, then it's that football kit, said his mother suddenly. Ever since you've been wearing that blessed football kit. She couldn't continue and left the room in floods of tears. The spots were growing at an alarming rate. Very soon his whole body was covered in a mass of itchy zits that throbbed and pulsated like a set of disco lights. He stopped going to school because other children's mothers were afraid that his condition might be contagious. Terry just lay in his darkened room, wondering why on earth it should happen to him. One night, Terry found out. He couldn't sleep. The spots itched him more than usual, and whenever he scratched one he felt a pop, which was so painful that he had to bite his lip so as not to cry out. He lost count of how many spots popped that night, but at a guess I'd say somewhere in the region of 1,020. At three o'clock he could bear it no longer. He let out a pathetic wail and cried for his mummy. She came running into the room, tripping over her dressing gown and landing face down in a pool of sticky stuff by his bed. Cue more tears from mother. Her baby was lying on the bed, his skin all purple and bubbling, and where there had once been spots, there were now 1,019 name tags. 
and each one proclaimed in bold letters, A Phantom. But what of the 1,020th spot? If you recall, I said that 1,020 spots had popped that night. Terry's mother found it. It was the biggest name tag of all, stitched into the back of Terry's neck, and on it was printed one word, five simple letters. Thief. Cut it off, wailed Terry, as his mother rushed into the bathroom to find a pair of nail scissors. Unpick the stitches, please. Terry's mother snipped away at the stitches for half an hour, but just as soon as she had pulled one out, another one magically appeared to take its place. There's only so much unpicking a mother can take. Terry's mother finally laid down her scissors, turned Terry round to face her, and asked him what it was all about. Terry's confession took a little under an hour to come tumbling out. He told his mother about the ring with the skull on it, about the radios, the bags of sweets and the gym bag in the locker room. His mother listened without saying a word, but when he had finished and had cried himself dry, she told him what he had to do. The next day, Terry went back to school. He hung his head in shame as he sloped through the playground. The other children stopped shouting and pointed at him. They had never seen a boy covered in name tags before. He went into the building by the side door and slipped past the head teacher's office into the locker room. Terry checked to see if he was alone before taking the gym bag out from underneath his jumper. Then climbing onto a bench, he reached up and hung it over the peg on which he had first found it. Quickly he jumped down and ran out of the locker room. If he'd bothered to look back at the peg upon which the bag was now hanging, he would have seen them both disappear in a puff of purple smoke, leaving in their place a thin trickle of green slime which spread across the wall and clearly shaped itself into seven neat letters. The message read, Goodbye. The next day, Terry's name tags had completely vanished, all except one, Thief. That remained stuck fast to the back of his neck. After several hot baths, however, even the Thief label started to fade until eventually it just curled up and dropped off onto his pillow one night. Terry never stole again. He had the odd lapse when he looked at a chocolate bar in a sweet shop or passed an unpadlocked bicycle in the street. But it only ever took the tiniest itch on the back of his neck to pull him round to his senses. <laughs>